There's a race to extract natural gas from vast swathes of the United States. But is hydraulic fracking the cure for an energy-hungry country or a fatally flawed process that will have disastrous consequences for people and the environment? You're watching Inside Story Americas from Washington. Hello, I'm Shihab Rutansi. It's backers say it's the answer to America's energy crisis and a way to prize the United States from dependency on foreign oil. Estimates of vast deposits of shale gas under U.S. soil have led to intense pressure from industry and government to extract it in a process known as hydraulic fracturing or fracking. But there's increasing evidence that fracking comes at an enormous cost to health with reports of highly toxic chemicals seeping into water supplies. The industry has spent vast sums of money lobbying the U.S. Congress to avoid any government regulation of its practices. But there are even new doubts over the much-touted positive economic benefits fracking brings to the communities it so profoundly affects. Tom Ackerman reports. It's the 21st century version of a gold rush. The footprints of America's natural gas bonanza visible from New York State in the Northeast to Colorado in the Mountain West. And its potential is something Barack Obama is eager to promote. We have a supply of natural gas that can last America nearly 100 years. And my administration will take every possible action to safely develop this energy. Experts actually differ about the abundance of those gas reserves, but for a fossil fuel, it holds two big attractions, currently two-thirds cheaper than oil and expending much less carbon dioxide than either oil or coal. At issue, though, is how safely natural gas is being extracted from the ground. The process of hydraulic fracturing or fracking involves lots of water and chemicals pumped under high pressure into the veins of shale rock that lie deep below the surface. The side effects of that process are hotly debated. Thanks to an exclusion that the Congress granted to the natural gas industry, there is virtually no policing of its impact on the water Americans drink or the air that they breathe. In one Wyoming town, though, the Environmental Protection Agency recently found toxic chemicals associated with fracking in local groundwater. But it cautioned not to draw broad conclusions from that study. New York State is currently considering an extension of its moratorium on fracking operations. There and in other places, fracking will be a continuing flashpoint between the economic boon and the environmental downside of natural gas. So does hydraulic fracking come at too great a cost to our health and to our environment? With us to discuss this in the studio is Dr. Bernard Goldstein, Emeritus Professor from the University of Pittsburgh Graduate School of Public Health, who's testified before Congress on the issue. Michael McKenna, formerly with the Energy Department, now President of the corporate communications company MWR Strategies. And from New York, Josh Fox, the director of the Oscar-nominated documentary Gasland, about the natural gas drilling industry. Michael McKenna, first of all, do we agree, though, that if this can be safely extracted, it will be some sort of panacea for, for the U.S.'s energy needs, 100 years of gas and so forth? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you can see just since we've been doing it um, in the last five years, right, uh, the new style hydraulic fracturing, gas prices have gone from $15 per mm BTU down to $2.5. So... There's no doubt about the economic benefits. Actually, we can, we can show a, a map of one of the most hotly contested areas right now for natural gas. That's the Marcellus Shale area, the largest known natural gas reservoir in the U.S. It covers large areas of Pennsylvania, New York, Ohio, West Virginia, extends into parts of Virginia. Among these states, Pennsylvania has the largest reserves. More than 4,000 wells have already sprung up there. But most of the Marcellus Shale remains untapped. Josh Fox, clearly this is a, a real focus right now for the natural gas industry. Is this then that the, the Saudi Arabia of natural gas as it's been put before then? Well, I, I, I hate to start off a segment by disagreeing with two things in your opening. The first, that natural gas burns cleaner than coal and oil, uh, or rather has 
have less emissions than coal and oil. Yes, it burns cleaner, but we've been, uh, the new science shows that fracking vents off so much methane into the atmosphere that there's no appreciable difference between using the, natural the gas The actual and mining of the, of the gas means that, um, means that there's yeah, no difference. Yeah, exactly. Right. When you're actually mining this gas and drilling for it, you're venting off m huge amounts of methane into the atmosphere, and that offsets any carbon benefit from the burning. The second thing that I would say is that, y you, yes, you might have oil and gas companies make profits, but at what cost? It, this doesn't amount to an economic boom, in my opinion. This amounts to a fire sale or a liquidation sale. Well, that's, that's you simply true. cannot have sustainable agriculture, tourism, most of the industries that sustain a lot of the places in the Northeast, and drilling at the same time. You're, and you also can't have living. I mean, a lot of this drilling is being slated for living areas, recreation areas. Uh, you see real estate prices tank in areas where you have major industrial drilling. That's Essentially what you're doing is reducing the, the, those areas to the price of the shale gas, which will disappear over time, and you have ruined sustainable industries. So to me, this is a bad plan poorly executed. Let's the run the through bad plan Josh. is that, yes? Let's just run through some of the, the, the sort of um, reports that we have been hearing, and there have been a spate of reports in the last few months uh, about the possible consequences of the environmental impact and health impact of fracking. The New York Times reported last year that wastewater from hundreds of wells had high radiation levels. Wastewater discharge into rivers and streams were untested for radiation. A Duke University study found potentially toxic methane gas levels in drinking water near natural gas wells, levels so high they can create the risk of explosion. Air pollution due to drilling, which is what Josh was referring to, is also a growing threat. The US state of Wyoming failed in 2009 to meet air quality standards for the first time in its history, partly it's thought because of fumes from wells. Professor Goldstein, perhaps we should start at the beginning then and, and talk about the actual process, why there, there, there are so many concerns. And you have to, I suppose, begin with the fracking fluid and indeed what that fluid becomes once it's actually, um, it enters into the ground and, and sort of meets the methane and so forth. I mean, I guess that's our starting point. Yeah, that, that, that's a good question. And the, the answer is I don't know. And too often I don't know when we have the public being concerned and calling us and saying, I've got these symptoms, my kid is sick with this, could it be due to the fracking compounds? Well, we don't know what's uh, being used in the, in the local wells. We do have a list, a very large list, of many chemicals that have been used through the years, but a lot of these are, uh, well, we put it this way, if somebody's got a symptom, there's at least one chemical on that list that could have caused that symptom, but I don't know if it was used locally. And Michael McKenna, then the, the response from the industry as well, it's all anecdotal, and there isn't really any firm evidence. Is well, that I would point out that the Duke University study you mentioned noted that they couldn't describe it because they had no baseline data. I agree with the doctor. The reality of it is is that despite the sort of studies that we have, none of them are really very good and we don't know. And, you know, should we find out? Yeah, without question. But should people run around making wild accusations before we know? I don't think so. And since Josh opened up this can of worms, let me jump on it. There is one thing in the promo that was um, inaccurate, right? It said that the um, wells are drilled without any regulatory oversight. That's not true. And states provide regulatory oversight. Right. Uh, well, Josh, what do you make of that regulatory like oversight? Or regulatory oversight. It's one of the reasons why the gas drilling proponents would like the EPA out of the picture and hand that over to the states. But going back to the health, these are not wild accusations. I, I have traveled all over the United States to 30 states. I have traveled all over the world observing this drilling. In almost every area that I've gone to, people complain of the same symptoms. And you have workers who are literally bathing in these fracking chemicals. I have those uh, examples on tape. You have people coming through saying, well, I, I started to work with these chemicals, or these emissions started to come into my house. All of a sudden, I became dizzy. I went to the doctor. I had these compounds in my blood. This is a situation um, which has reached a crisis level. You don't have people reporting the same illnesses all across the country, the same compounds showing up in their blood, in their water, in their air, workers becoming sick. I mean, since we put out our film Gasland, we have been inundated with thousands 
of emails from people across the country, both workers and citizens who are living in these drilling zones, complaining of health problems. Josh this is a human health issue that cannot be ignored. And when you have a human health crisis as a result of moving a drilling zone into a residential area, the answer is quite simple. You do not compromise Americans' health for the profits of oil and gas. You must stop that activity until you figure out what's going on, until you have a major epidemiological study. Josh Fox, we, we, I can show a clip of actually from, from your film, a particularly vivid clip of uh, the, uh, the effect uh, that the, the, the local residents felt uh, fracking was having on their local water supply. Josh traveled across America, uh, going to, from community to community. Uh, remarkably similar results across these communities where fracking was in the vicinity across the country. Here's a clip from that film, Gasland. Oh, yeah, I saw it go up for a second. Yeah. We'll just give it a second here. Whoa, Jesus Christ. I call uh, McKenna, so, and then what we hear from the industry as well, these uh, areas, their water supply, their water tables already had high levels of methane or whatever and were flammable anyway way before fracking. That seems to be the response. Well, let me point out three things right. real quick. Uh, one is there are about 85 communities in this country named Burning Springs or some variation thereon. There's been methane in the water in the United States for as long as there's been the United States in the United States. Second, there's been no baseline work, so it's impossible to ascribe the methane in the drinking water to fracking. And EPA has pretty steadfastly refused to do that, even with the results in Pavilion. And third, there's no telling how many takes it took to get that. Um, Professor Goldstein. Let me focus on the baseline issue. Go for it. Uh, industry really should be required right. when they come into a community to do baseline testing on the water so that we have some ideas to whether or not there are changes. So who is the burden of proof well, on them, can I, Professor? Can I just I don't, jump in? Josh, we'll come to you in a sec, but, but who, is the, who is the burden of proof on them? Is it on those who want to use brand new technologies to, 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 to get this gas, or is it on those getting sick to prove that, that, that there is an effect on them? How does this work, well, Professor? Well, clearly, it, in, our, in our approach is that we'll you, come to you, you need minute, to Josh. have the industry, you need to have those who are making the money from it uh, show safety. And you need to have that up front, not look at it afterwards and say, oh, gee, we made a mistake. Let's change things. Josh, quickly. Well, on the burden of proof, uh, the 2005 energy bill explicitly reverses the burden of proof on public lands uh, from the industry to the public. So the public now has to prove that the industry is doing wrong, whereas before the uh, industry had to prove themselves safe. But let's just talk about baseline testing. Mm -hmm. In Pennsylvania, in the town of Dimmick, the PADEP under John Hanger and Governor Ed Rendell proved without a shadow of a doubt that there was no level, there were no levels of methane in the water in Dimmick, and they came in and made a determination order that, in fact, Cabot Oil and Gas had polluted the water, including uh, water that could be lit on fire. The same thing is true in Weatherford, Texas, where EPA came in with an enforcement order. The same thing is true in Pavilion, Wyoming, where they had baseline testing. The same thing is true in Amy Ellsworth's case, who is the next door neighbor of Mike Markham, who you saw uh, in the clip there, who could also light her water on fire. They proved without a shadow of a doubt that there was no methane in their baseline, and there weren't other drilling chemicals that showed up in those tests as well in their baseline. Michael so when you have somebody coming out and making blanket statements, that are not specific, you can tell that they're actually just coming out as a spokesperson for the industry and trying to cast aspersions on the actual science. I'm not a spokesman for the industry. I don't take a single dime from anybody involved in hydraulic fracturing. I would say this, if that's all true, you have legal remedies in this country. It's called trespass. If it was beyond the shadow of a doubt, the legal standard is beyond a reasonable doubt. Right, well, and actually, in civil cases, that in, in a case civil, when you are Josh, a single, you human, let me finish for a second. Single citizen in civil, fighting against Halliburton in civil is cases, one, your Josh, one just lawyer give us a second. you're paying out of pocket versus a huge corporation. I think the industry would like to take those chances. Josh, and I know you're trying to sell a movie, but let everybody else get a word in. The, in civil <laughs> cases, it's preponderance <laughs> of the evidence. Professor, clearly, the Obama administration there is pretty gung ho about this technology. Are, are you finding, and you've you know appeared on Capitol Hill and so forth, that they are actively looking into some of these issues of the medical effects, the toxicology, the effect on humans, the fact on, I mean, this has been going on for decades after all this technology, even though now we have a, slightly, a variant on the technology of fracking. 
are they really investigating this as, as they talk about a, a safe future for natural gas in this country? Yeah. My concern is the, the, the uh, confusion gendered by saying this has been going on for decades. Yes, it ha hydrofracking has been going on for decades, but it's been relatively shallow wells straight down, and it's been, say, 50,000 gallons of water. Now you have 5 million gallons of water. Clearly, it's a new technology, and the public is confused and angry about the idea that someone is standing in front of them, very often in a commercial, saying, isn't this an exciting new technology that allows us to get the natural gas, which will get us out of our energy crisis? But don't worry. We've been doing this for 50 years. So it's, a dual argument. it's a dual argument that but we've been doing it for years, but on the, on the other hand, we now have this new technology that could well, it's, it's, can get it's the market. Well, it's a clear contradiction, and it's not the first contradiction that this industry would have you, you believe in. On the issue of lawsuits, however, I have been with families who have lost their homes because they have had to settle with gas companies where gas companies have literally taken them away from their property. But the other thing that happens in a, in a civil lawsuit, often when you're challenged with that much legal might against you, your family, or maybe even a group of families, you are often forced to sign a non-disclosure agreement, which means you can no longer speak about what happened to you. And I think that there's a, 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 something to be said for the fact that when you've taken away somebody's home due to contamination, and you've taken away their right to tell their story. You've done something fundamental to the identity of those people. Those are two things that I appreciate as being how you know who you are, Professor, where you're from, and your ability to tell your story. And I when you enter into a civil suit, it's a, it, against a Halliburton or an Exxon or a Shell, the chances are that you will lose both, thi both of those things are pretty high. Professor, I want to just nail this down there. Is the president taking advice from people with experience in health and toxicology? We're worried that he's, that he's not. Uh, we've looked at uh, uh, the president's uh, own advisory commission that he established last year. We've looked at two advisory commissions established in states, one in Maryland, one in Pennsylvania. There are 52 members. There is no one with even the slightest background in health on any of those uh, commissions. Uh, each of the executive orders say there's a concern about public health. But yet, somehow or other, no health experts got onto uh, those commissions. We don't know why. There's a great deal of money floating around here in Washington, um, which, um, which is another topic I suppose we, we should really deal with. A study by the nonprofit government watchdog group Common Cause says natural gas interests have been, quote, stunningly successful, end quote, in avoiding government regulation of fracking. Natural gas companies have spent more than $747 million over the past 10 years to win the support of Congress and state legislators. Their donations heavily favor legislators who backed that 2005 Energy Policy Act, which exempted fracking from regulations such as the Safe Drinking Water Act. Drilling companies don't even need to reveal the to the public what chemicals they use, as we've just heard. That exemption, widely known as the Halliburton loophole, named after the oil company associated with then Vice President Dick Cheney, who largely prepared the energy bill. Michael McKenna, how can that be right? Though? How can it be right uh, for a company to be able to um, to uh, send what they admit are toxic chemicals deep into the ground, close to water tables, without having to disclose uh, what is actually in those chemicals and, yeah, and so forth. How a couple things, work? right, mm. that are probably need to be correcting here. First off, um, everyone discloses, right, through material safety data sheets required to on the work site. And in most states, including Pennsylvania, um, you disclose on a website. Now, Pennsylvania needs to do better about that. I'm not going to argue about it. They need to localize it. Um, there's no doubt. But it is getting better, and it's going to get better. The second thing is is that fracking jobs tend not to be anywhere near the water table. They tend to be thousands of feet below the water table, which is partially why everyone's having trouble figuring out how any possible pathway to the drinking water table gets there. And the third thing is, I'm not completely sure why it's called the Halliburton loophole, since Halliburton doesn't really make a hell of a lot of money off it. The truth of the matter is, is that the producers... Didn't they master the technology involved there? In the the Halliburton's been working right drilling right technology for 100 years. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter what you drill, you're going to have to buy a Halliburton product. They couldn't care less. I think it's because of Dick Cheney's and role, I, perhaps, in the 2005 energy bill, perhaps. I don't know. It but could be, but I would point out... And, and I'm sorry, doctor, no, I don't mean to interrupt. Problem. I would point out... Obama's been president for three years now. He had a Democratic Congress. Right. No, that's very important. They've that. done nothing to roll it back. In fact, in the State of the Union, Obama explicitly said, this is something that's good. This is something I want to do. And that is a point, actually. Can I, can uh, Josh Fox, I mean, there, there, there are plans. I mean, there is a bill that has been stalled for some time to reverse the Halliburton loophole. What happened yeah. to that? Why, why, why it's, is that? It's called the... 
it, it's called the Frack Act. But the answer to your question is the obvious. The industry campaigned and lobbied to the tune of $250 million to get the Safe Drinking Water Act exemption, frankly, because they have something to hide. When those chemicals appear in somebody's water supply, the industry can go, oh, it wasn't us. And that's because they weren't required to disclose the chemicals. Now, the Obama administration said something very specific. I happen to believe he's dead wrong about how much gas there is in the water supply and uh, that this is in abundance. I think that that was a, a serious policy mistake. But what he did say was we require these companies to disclose the chemicals, i.e. in favor of the Frack Act on public lands. Now that should be expanded to all lands in the United States. And the second thing, interestingly, that just came out of the Interior Department is the Interior Department said that well casings must not leak. Now, this is very, very crucial, and this is the answer to the question that the, uh, I, I think Mr. McKenna uh, po posed. How could you possibly get chemicals in the water supply if the fracking is 8,000 feet down? Well, you have to drill through the water table to get to 8,000 feet down. It's not as if you can magically get gas on the surface without going through the water table. The thing that protects the water table is called the, the casing. It's a cement casing. In most cases, it's one inch thick. The industry has admitted that there is no way for them to solve casing problems and that 50% of the well casings deteriorate over the life of the well. 50%. Now, you don't just drill one well. You drill 100. So you're going to have in a town, for example, or 30. So you're going to have 50% of those over time. Uh, Po possibly creating communication between those underground layers where there's volatile organic compounds, chemicals, the gas itself, and the water table. And this is what we're seeing. We're seeing new fracking have problems, we're seeing new drilling have problems, and we're also seeing old drilling have problems. Where you have a, a conduit well yeah, that's going from the surface next to a new well that is creating a contamination of the aquifer. And this is incredibly serious because there's no good way to clean an aquifer. Yeah, I, once it's done, once the chemicals are introduced into the landscape, they can't come back out again. So what you're doing here with the industry admitting that the casing is a problem, uh, you're trading water, Josh, an eternity let's of just water, get Michael for, to, the, to, to for the moment of this gas. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm glad after 15 minutes we're finally getting to the real question here. Here, right? The real question isn't fracking, and the real question isn't you know the chemicals that go into the ground. The real question is the integrity of the well casing, and there's no doubt that that um, is really terribly important, and we need to be very and terribly flawed there. No, not terribly flawed. That you know, the truth of the matter is, well casing is something that the, the industry's been doing for 100, 120 years now. Know a lot about you know. Do have there been instances where the well casing integrity has been breached? Without a doubt. Okay, so but the stress, but industry but documents that but say that stress to the Josh, public, forty to fifty percent of the well casing deteriorate. The stress, stress to the deteriorate. public is because they read in the newspaper the statement you just made that hydrofracking does not ever get to groundwater. By which you mean that if you re successfully release the chemicals five thousand foot underground, that no proof it gets to groundwater. And on the other hand, they read that gee, there's this community that's been taken off of their well water. This company's been fined a million dollars. Uh, because of hydrofracking. To, to the public, hydrofracking is everything from the time you level the drill pad to the time you go away 20 years from now. I agree, and, and I agree and, totally. And, and truthfully, and that's that because. just is building up the kind of stress and concern that public but has. But do you think the oil and gas industry deserves the trust of the American people right now, Professor? Well, not if no, it keeps not telling not. these uh, diametrically contradictory stories. Because this does seem to be about trust to a certain extent. Sure, in, it does. In the oh, absence of, of clearly, studies, in the absence clearly, of government, you know, let's let's uh, see if we can let's see if we can't if we can't cut to the chase and make it long and short. Right, the reality of it is is that the resource base is so enormous, and that the benefits to society are so huge, that the oil and gas industry um, deserves trust on that level, and has trust on technological levels about well casing integrity and things like that and needs to retain it and improve it where they can in those instances where there may have been problems. I've got to admit that that's maybe the first time I've ever heard somebody say, trust them, they have all the money. Um, that's uh, an, an absolutely amazing statement. I didn't say that. We could trust the oil and gas industry as soon as they stop paying our legislators to do their bidding. Do you How think these that? calls for the, for the There for is the... no way for a citizen group to compete with their advertising dollars, to compete with their lobbying dollars, to compete with their power in terms of spending 
in campaign. Do you think the course that of the Environmental the Protection Agency industries. to be abolished and directly comes connected from, to this thing? But right? it doesn't, doesn't make what they're saying true. It just makes what they're saying Josh, let me ask forceful. you a question. Are, are you contesting that there's a, gi a gigantic economic benefit from this process? Absolutely I am contesting You're that. You're contesting that. We should be that. leaving this gas in the ground. You are a we very so lonely much, man on a very so, small no, island. I'm actually absolutely not. But so how, how lonely in is, fact, is Josh Fox are, in this? What, thing, when you're talking about what you're doing here. <laughs> Josh, we'll have to stop you because we're running well, out of time. There were a lot of people saying the very same thing about the banking industry and the no money down I mean, you, you think gas can be extracted safely at some point, perhaps? Well, let me, let me, let me try it this way. 20 years from now, we run out of gas in the Marcella shale, we're told, 20, 30 years from now. The question I have is why do we need to start today? If there's 20 years, if we start a year from now, it's 21 years that we're going to run out. We're going to run out at some time certain. Let's wait until we have some ideas as to how to most optimally protect us. We've shown in our work that uh, the state uh, has uh, uh, looked, has, caused, uh, has called violations on a number of the companies. Uh, some of them have more than twice as many violations as they have wells. Some of them have no violations. The ones with no violations should be encouraged to continue. The ones who are messing and up the world should be stopped. Professor Goldstein, thank you very much. Michael McKenna, thank you too. And Josh Fox, thanks very much. Thank That's you. That's all from the Inside Story team in Washington. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter and Facebook, where you can find more information about the program. And we want to hear from you. Tell us what stories you think we should be covering. Send your ideas directly to us at InsideStory at AljazeeRa.net.